I'm going to make a video on how to fly your drone for fun. Okay, and in this video right here, this is going to have all the information you need to make sure that you follow all the regulation uh, that's uh, contained under 44809 USC, the code, US code 44809. There's nine things that you have to do, and I'm going to highlight those nine things in this video. So let's get started. All right, we've been getting a lot of questions about how and what you need to do to fly your drone. And these questions came after the FA released Trust very recently. And um, we'll talk about what Trust is because it's actually one of these nine items. But before we dig in and before we talk about these nine items, I want to talk about the difference between flying for recreational purposes and then not flying for recreational purposes. And actually, I'm going to flip this over on its head because, because here's how it works, okay? The FAA created this regulation for everyone to follow if they're going to fly their drone in the United States. And that regulation is called Part 107. And you can say, well, Greg, isn't Part 107 for commercial flying? Well, kind of, kind of. And that's where the confusion comes in. Think about us. Part 107 is the umbrella. It's the overall regulation that everyone has to follow in the United States if they want to fly their drone. But but the FAA decided to carve out a little section of it called 44809, USC 44809, which is an exemption. It's an exemption from Part 107 for people who want to fly their drone for fun. The FAA basically said, well, actually, the FAA didn't say that, but uh, Congress basically said, well, uh, if somebody's going to fly their drone for fun, they don't need to follow uh, Part 107. They need to follow a different set of regulation, which is a little bit simpler. Okay. So when we talk about Part 107 and when we talk about 44809, the, the the exemption for recreational flying, there are two different sets of regulation. There's two different things that you need to follow. So I'm going to talk about today 44809. I'm going to tell you how and what things you have to do to qualify for the exemption. And if you don't qualify for all nine of these things, guess where you belong? You belong in part 107. And this is very important. This is something that's very tricky because if you decide not to follow one of these nine things, the FAA could technically come back and say, well, you don't qualify for the exemption. You don't qualify for all the things in 44809. Therefore, you now must follow the rules of uh, Part 107. And I'm going to say, where's your Part 107 certificate? And you're going to say, well, I don't have one. I'm flying for fun. Well, not according to this because you're not following all this regulation. So I want to make this clear. I want to really highlight the difference between Part 107 and recreational flying because there's a, there's a clear line between the two. And some people have asked me, where do these nine things come from? A little bit of history. These nine things that, that are in, in 44, uh, 809, they came from Congress. Congress mandated that the FAA puts these rules in place after the uh, Reauthorization Act of 2018. So after that happened, the FAA was basically mandated. They were given a list of things to do, a honeydew, and then they've been checking off these items one after the other. And out of these nine items, there were two of them that were left until recently. One one of them was trust. Trust was actually released and now is available. This is a test that you're going to have to take. And then the last one was and still is, as I'm recording this, is the CBO, the community based organization. So I'm going to talk about CBOs in a second. But I want to give you a little bit of history and really make sure that we delineate the difference between part 107 and recreational flying. So let's dig in. Let's talk about these nine rules that you have to follow if you want to qualify for the exemption, if you want to qualify for not having a part 107 certificate. And the first one, is very well it's very straightforward on paper but really in real life it's not straightforward and that rule is you must be flying you drone strictly for recreational purposes and this has been a subject of many debates uh, lots of wrong information out there flying for recreational purposes it's all about the intent of the flight you grab your drone okay i have a drone right here i grab my drone and i say I'm just going to go out and I'm going to fly for fun. I'm going to enjoy flying my drone around. That's the purpose of the flight. That's the intent of the flight, to fly for recreational purposes. Well, guess what? That qualifies for this first bullet point. What doesn't qualify is if you say your friend comes over and say, hey, you know, I just started this business and I really need somebody to do drone footage so I can put them on my website. Can you do that? 
And you're going to say, well, no, because I don't have my part 107, because that is an activity that requires part 107. Why? Because the intent of the flight is no longer to fly for recreational purposes. The intent of the flight now is to get out the door and capture footage for somebody else. Are you getting paid? It doesn't matter. Are you doing this for your church? Are you doing this for a non-for-profit organization out of your goodwill? It doesn't matter because the intent of the flight is to capture footage. It's not to go and fly for recreational purposes. So there's been a lot of discussion about YouTube channels. People saying, well, I'm going to put my footage on, on YouTube. Uh, do I need a part 107? And the answer is, in most cases, no, you don't, because you may still be flying. You may still be recording footage. Recording footage in itself does not require part 107. OK, the intent of the flight, the reason why you record the footage really is. Now, a lot of people are also going to argue and say, well, how do you prove intent? And you're right, you can't. And, and this is something that's going to be very difficult. But if you decide to go fly for recreational purposes, you have a YouTube channel that's monetized, guess what? Monetize, now all of a sudden, you're not really doing this for fun. You're doing this to put on your channel that's making you money. Now we drew a line, now we are flying under part 107. So make sure you understand this. Quite frankly, part 107, I've been arguing this for years and years, not a bad thing to get if you uh, are interested in flying your drone for more than just flying for fun. It's an exam. It's a 60 question exam. It's uh, if you study properly, then it's something that you can pass. The investment is rather minimal. It's $173 for the test as I'm recording this. And then if you use a course, uh, it's about $150. This is the course that we provide $150. So all in all, you've got a $300 investment and then you can fly under part 107 and forget about everything that I'm talking about right now. Okay, bullet number one. Let's go to bullet number two right now which is the one that the FAA hasn't put in place yet, but they have a way to comply with it, which is you must follow community-based organization guidelines. Now, I said that the FAA still has one task item that they need to complete, and that's the one right here. They haven't sat down with the community-based organization or with the uh, error modeling organizations that exist at the moment, and, uh, and they need to do that. So that's next on their list. And when that happens, then we'll have a set, we'll have a, a list of acceptable community-based organizations that you can follow in order to uh, to get a, a set of guidelines. Now, I've had several people asking questions and said, do I need to join a CBO and, and pay the fee, the monthly fee or the yearly fee? And the answer is no. You just say, you declare that you're using their guidelines. They should be available on their website for free. And if they're not available on their website for free, look somewhere else because somebody else is going to have those guidelines. We actually recommend that you look at the Flight Test Community Association, the FTCA, these guys are great. They've been doing this for a long time. And not only that, but they're a ton of fun because they, uh, if you've ever seen Flight Test, which is the company Flight Test Community uh, Association is their non-for-profit that is helping people uh, build up and and, uh, and and get into the hobby. So the, these guys, they, they create all these awesome uh, fixed wing aircraft that they fly around, uh, that they chase each other. Uh, if you haven't watched them, go, go, go and have, I'm sure you have. If you're on this channel, I'm sure you've seen Flight Test. But anyway, Flight Test Community Association has a set of guidelines that you can use and, um, and you can follow that. And, and they're working obviously on becoming a CBO when the FAA is going to approve the CBO. So if you don't want to pick a CBO, the FAA also said that you can use the guidelines at the moment, at the moment, until the, there are CBOs that are selected. You can use the guidelines in the advisory circular 9147 Bravo. And, uh, and there is a set of guidelines in there that you can use. So if the FAA pulls you over or comes in and have a chat with you and they say, well, what kind of guidelines are you using? And you can say Flight Test Community Association or you can say I'm using the advisory circular 9147 Bravo. And this right here, bullet number two, is one of the most um, ignored maybe or or unknown rule in 44809. So make sure that you have a backup plan. Make sure you can say, yeah, this is this is who I'm following. This is who I'm using. Bullet number three, pretty straightforward, maintain visual line of sight. I, there is not much more that I can say about this. You have to keep the drone within line of sight, which means that 
Um, you can go miles and miles away where you can't see the drone. You have to maintain visual line of sight because the FA wants you to be able to look around and make sure that there's no other traffic that's dangerous. Now, if you rely only at looking on your screen, then this angle of view on the screen is not wide enough to see everything around you. So that's not good enough. You need to make sure that you have line of sight and that you can see what's going on. In addition, if you're flying FPV, first person view, you also need to have a visual observer with you to act as your eyes in the sky if you want. The FAA said that um, if you're basically removing your goggles, you know, if you're flying FPV and you remove your goggles, you should have the ability to basically see the drone out there. So that's Bullet number two right here. Now, do you have to stare at the aircraft the entire time? No, you don't. You can take your, off, your eyes off of the aircraft to look at your screen maybe, to look for traffic, to look for people that are on the ground, to talk to your crew, whatever it is. But at all time, if you look up, you should be able to see it. That's, that's the way uh, to, uh, to qualify for visual line of sight. Bullet number four. Bullet number four is do not interfere. And this is uh, do not interfere with manned aircraft. You have to make sure that you stay out of the way of manned aircraft. Drones are basically at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of priority. Balloons, helicopters, airplanes, you name it, everything else has more priority than we do. So if you see a helicopter approaching at low altitude, you have to give them way. You have to get out of the way. So don't interfere with their operation. Now, I'm going to add something to this as well. Interfering doesn't mean that you need to be on the collision path with the aircraft. It doesn't mean you need to be right next to it to interfere. Okay. If you get and fly really close to an airport and you land on the runway and there's airplanes that are in the pattern and, uh, and it's reported that there's a drone on the runway, well, that's interfering with many aircraft. Even though you were not right next to them, you're interfering with the operation. So Stay out of airports if possible, unless you have a really good reason to be there um, and, and, and be careful with this, okay? The next one is get authorization to fly in the airspace. And there's two types of airspace. We get controlled airspace and we have uncontrolled airspace. Controlled airspace is near airports. Think about it this way, okay? Uncontrolled airspace is pretty much everything else. So if you're near an airport, chances are there's going to be an area where you need to get approval. And the way that you know that is you're going to look at Lance. Lance is a program that the FAA put in place. There's a bunch of grids when you look at Lance and these grids, they're going to tell you how high you can fly once you get approval. For example, I was flying this morning. We were in a grid that was 400 feet. So we could fly up to 400 feet after we requested authorization. How did I request authorization? I went right in there and I went into my Aloft app and I put in my request and within several seconds, I got a text message that said, you're good to fly up to 400 feet. It's not difficult. It's you can find all the information right there and then, uh, and then you can get your approval. Now, this is not the video for it, but actually we, we released a free course a couple days ago on recreational flying made easy. That's the name of the course. In there, I talk a lot more about how you're going to get in. It's a free course. If you want to enroll, I'm going to put a link down here. And if you want to get more information on this, if you don't know how to do it, go check it out. It, it's, uh, it's just a great resource because, again, we're getting so many questions that we decided to do something about it. I want to mention that you should never call air traffic control to get approval. You should never give them a phone call. That's not what they're here for. There is a process in place using Lance. Some airports are not part of Lance, in which case you need to go to the drone zone. Again, in the course, I show you how to submit Lance request and how to submit drone zone request uh, just to give you an idea of how this works. The next one, bullet number six, we're already at number six. Number six, do not fly higher than 400 feet in uncontrolled airspace. As a matter of fact, never anywhere, even in controlled airspace, never fly above 400 feet, 400 feet above the ground. In, control, in uncontrolled airspace, we call it class golf, in uncontrolled airspace, it's pretty much everywhere in the country that doesn't have an airport nearby uh, is going to be class golf. It's going to be uncontrolled airspace. So you don't need approval. You can just get up. You can go up to 400 feet. Don't exceed 400 feet. And uh, yeah, that's that's really it right here. The 400 feet limit is kind of important. Now you may say, why 400 feet? Can I go to 1500 feet above the ground? No, you can't because well, because there is other people flying in that airspace. Most manned aircraft, except helicopters, um, fly no 
uh, no lower than 500 feet above the ground. So 400 feet is a good limit. There's a 100 foot buffer. That's the reason the FAA did it the way that they did. And, uh, and that way, you know, we can all share the airspace. The next bullet point is number seven. And number seven is something that just came out. It's the trust exam. Trust is the recreational UAS safety test. And this is, and, and I wish we would call it safety training because that's really what it is. It's training to help you understand all these rules. Everything I'm talking about here is gonna be covered on the trust exam. There's a quick exam at the end, it's 23 questions. When you're done, you get a certificate. That little certificate is the proof that you meet this requirement right here, bullet number seven. You print it, you save it as a PDF, you put it in your fly bag, you put it on a lanyard. I don't really care what you do with it, but make sure you have it available. We are, and, and well, I need to add this. The best part is, this is free. The trust training is free. The, it takes about 15 to 30 minutes to complete and you can't fail it. So this is something that you need to be doing. And you can only do it at a trust approved uh, website. We actually, Pilot Institute is a trust approved uh, site by the FAA. So we have the ability to provide you with that test. We have the ability to give you a certificate. And once that certificate is issued, it's good forever. And you just meet the requirements. As a matter of fact, right here, I'm gonna put a link to the video so you guys can see a video that we posted on trust. If you have more questions about trust, just head over to that link and then uh, you'll be able to get all that information. All right, the last thing, the next thing, there's one, there's two more. Eight is you need to register your drone. If your drone is more than 250 grams and less than 55 pounds, it needs to be registered with the FAA. So um, how does that work? You go on FAA Drone Zone, that's their website. It's a .gov website. If you find anything else that's not .gov, walk away, find a .gov website. I'm gonna put a link down in the description as well. It's one registration per person, it's good for five, for three years, and it's only $5. When you're done, what you're gonna get is a number, and that number, you're gonna put it on the drone. See, I use a little label maker right here to print my label for my drone, and, uh, and you'll be able to put it on there. Every drone that you own, you put the same number on it. As a recreational flyer, you get one number, you apply to all of your drones. As I said, it's good for three years, it's only $5. If someone is trying to charge you more than $5, you walk away, okay? You're in the wrong place. So always with a dead gov on the outside. The last thing, bullet number nine, is a really important one. Do not operate your drone in a dangerous manner. And that encompasses a lot of different things. But the first one is stay away from emergency response vehicle, from law enforcement activities, anything that is going on uh, you want to stay away from. Uh, forest fires is a perfect example. Large events like the Super Bowl, for example, that have a temporary flight restriction, you need to stay away from all of this. We cover all of these restrictions in the course, actually, the course I mentioned earlier. Make sure you, you enroll in that if you want more information. There's a, a, a restriction over Washington, D.C. Um, there is restrictions over parks like Disney, for example. There is temporary flight restriction when the president travels, when we have hurricane events, when we have uh, just something that you really need to be aware of because you don't want to get caught doing this. And the last thing is flying dangerously, which is uh, should be common sense. Don't fly under the influence of drugs. Don't fly under the influence of alcohol. And uh, just keep it clean. Keep it safe. Use your brain, use your common sense, right? And, uh, and then everything will be fine. So that's all I have. That's, I wanted to cover all these things because I know there's always a bunch of questions, but as long as you meet all nine of these requirements, you qualify for the exemption from part 107, that moves you into 44809, where you're able to operate as a recreational flyer. If you miss any of these, you no longer qualify for 44809, now you fall back under part 107 and you need to make sure you have a certificate, all right? So it's like a checklist, it's all or nothing. If you're not, miss, if you're not checking all nine of these, then you don't qualify, you fall under part 107. All right, I know you'll have comments, leave them down in here, I'm happy to respond. Make sure you enroll in that course if you want more information. It is free. We, we, don't, we don't ask you for your credit card. This is a service that we do to the community. And, um, and then you'll hopefully get some information out of it. Um, as always, like, subscribe if you uh, like the channel. And then I'll see you guys next time.